Around 2008, way before I even thought of putting pen to paper myself, whilst browsing YouTube for more songs to try and learn on my guitar, I stumbled across a particular video that in the end would set off a domino effect of events which would bring new inspirations my way, and eventually would lead me towards pursuing my dream to become a writer. That video involved a certain musical hero of mine performing with another artist who I'd never seen or heard of before. That was the day I discovered the magic and genius of Stuart Davis, and from that day on his music would lead me down new paths towards my own creative journey. Today I have the honour of finally talking to Stuart myself for Dead Men Talk in what could easily be my most personally dear and most important podcast to date. Don't take my word for it, check out what other influential figures and critics have to say about Stuart. And then stick around for a while and check out what happened when Stuart dropped into Dead Men Talk. Enjoy. Welcome to another very, very special episode of Dead Men Talk. And what a way to finish the current season and indeed the, the final episode of Dead Men Talk for 2021. I feel like I've saved the best for last. And it's it's probably the biggest, most important uh, guest I've had on for me personally since I started doing this last year. Um, this is someone whose work... Um, I discovered many years ago and it's been quite inspirational to me right at the beginning when I first decided I want to start writing myself. Um, Multi-talented singer, songwriter, actor, director, anything else you can throw out there, feel free. But um, I welcome to the show, Stuart Davis. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for your kind words. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. You, um, I, I, I'll, I'll get straight in. Really, I'll, I'll sort of put the background in with, you know, for people watching, listening to this. I, I discovered you through your music, um, and I'll get into you know particular ones and that. But the, what I, what I've been most interested in when I've started this podcast is to delve into the the stories behind people's creativity really mm. um you know stories behind stories over written songs whatever it is that they've done and yes i know you through your music but the more i've learned about you you have got such a story to tell everywhere else we can't possibly delve into all of it i'll do my best not with that attitude <laughs> hey there <you> go. <laughs> let's set let's let's try and do it shall we? in an hour um but you know i i, I really just want to sort of delve where we can into a lot of what you've done and you know how mm. it came about and you know your motivations your inspirations so we can get inside your head a bit mm -hmm. more as uh, as dangerous as that may be i'm not sure i'm, I'm along for the Prepare ride to be soiled that's all right that's all right <laughs> i've never had that said on there before so, <laughs> um. so, so i guess that the best way to kick it off is go go back as early as you can in in your life really you know tell us about sort of who you are where you came from in terms of your your when did you start to discover your own creative side in whatever it was that came first yeah it was definitely an identifiable moment in time my dad and brother were not songwriters but they played guitar and that live music was around the house from the both of them and I used to sit and listen to my dad sing often he had a great voice it was really it's one of the sad things not really a regret had I had the foresight to record my dad singing I wish I would have and I would encourage anyone as an, a tangential note in the beginning of our talk here if you can record your parents do that uh, it's just a cool thing to have. And my dad had a beautiful voice. He taught me three chords on a guitar. I was probably 10, maybe, or 11. 
at the most. And I went into the basement of our house with those three chords and God, eight years went by. I just nearly immediately, as soon as I discovered well, the many musicians and guitarists in particular will appreciate this fact, but those three chords obviously hold the tumbler key to many a safe and you can learn a practically inexhaustible number of songs using three chords. <clears throat> so that was an exciting initial prospect, but I very quickly found out I was more interested in writing songs than I was in learning them. So by the time I, I mean, maybe less than a year after I had started to play guitar, I bought a Tascam four track recorder. I didn't buy it, my mom and dad did. And I began to write songs. And by the time I was making recordings of my original songs, by the time I was 13, probably 14, cassettes. So I would write dozens of songs and then put them together in what I thought was an album and then make these recordings and duplicate the tapes one by one. By the time I got into high school, I had figured out you could have them mass produced, which we did. And so I had, <laughs> wow. in retrospect, I look back on my classmates with pity and apologetic <laughs> uh, meekness, but I sold, it was three or 400 cassette tapes of my first album in my high wow. school. There was only like a thousand kids in my high school. Wow. So I successfully tracked down and berated enough uh, of my class population to like, God, that's like probably a third of the entire high school had copies of wow. my first album, which I get a piss quiver thinking about now. Because <laughs> it was it's incriminatingly bad. Um, and then I was, by the, you know, by that time I was performing as well. And I was in jazz band and these performance ensembles and I formed a band and was performing at uh, graduation parties. And I also, in, in high school, I had my first gig gig where I had a club gig in Minneapolis. But the big thing in terms of creativity and how it connected later to a more multifaceted omnidirectional curiosity, let's say, among not only musical modalities, but anything from TV, film, painting, poetry. I don't sculpt, I'll say that right out of the gate, but I'm interested in pretty much everything else. And what I loved about curiosity and songwriting, I wouldn't have had the vocabulary or clarity to express this at the time, but in retrospect and looking back and tracing the milestones of my creative life as a multimedia artist. I just love the whole process of something coming from nothing. Mm -hmm. I just love the process of you sit down, there's nothing and you get up and there's something. Yeah. And it doesn't matter to me whether that's a screenplay or a painting or an extemporaneous comedy routine or a song. I'm fascinated by that. I'm fascinated when it occurs in isolation when you're in your basement and it's just you and a guitar. And I love it when it's an ensemble of dozens of people making a movie or whatever it is. So that really, at this point, I would say was the central magnetic component of life as an artist was this beguiling, ineffable miracle of something coming from nothing. I like that. I like that. And I, I can, you know, not quite on the same level probably, but I, I can relate to that. You know, I came a writer out of pretty much, um, it was my love of music really that got me thinking. I started, the first things I wrote down were song lyrics that are still in a pad somewhere. And yeah. I taught myself to play the guitar. I've never played outside of my house. Um, but it's the fact that then that led to something else. And then, you know, I ended up writing a book and, you know, I could sit in my car in my lunch break at work and, be producing something that in six months time I could hold in my hand you know exactly and, and that's kind of it became addictive in a while I can I can see how you can go off in all different directions it is it's addictive and perhaps in particular because it never duplicates mm, you yeah. can't at least my experience is I cannot simply transpose the formula which worked for the previous creative endeavor 
on to the next one. There is something singular and unique about at least the projects I truly feel transported and changed by. They come with their own singular formula. You have to find it. It's a relationship. In my view, in, in my experience, they are alive. Artwork has a great interiority to it. These are living mutualities that we engage into. So yeah, it is infinitely beguiling, interesting. And I think that the addictive component of that is that it requires something new of us as well each time. Yeah. And that's pretty darn magnetic. That's pretty sticky. Yeah. Yeah. Can you, can you, what were those three chords actually? I need to ask. Oh, you had to ask, huh? <laughs> you don't remember. Because I'm going to say A, D, and E, and you're going to go G, C, D on me because we know there's chord <laughs> camps. No, I, I kid. It was A, D, and E. Okay. Now, what's the, uh, what I think is really funny about this is that <laughs> I feel it's probably a developmental fulcrum in any singer-songwriter's life. The day in which you realize the chords you know are not necessarily the ones that match your vocal register. Right, yeah, yeah. So I wrote a lot of songs in keys that weren't necessarily <laughs> best suited for my voice and didn't learn until much later on, oh, for instance, the day you discover the capo exists. <laughs> oh, yeah, so I can't live without mine now. It's, that that yeah. is it. That changed everything. Yeah. Absolutely. So it was A, D, and E. But much later on, by the time I was in high school, I was in jazz band and whatnot, studying yeah. jazz. And so then it was all, all the chords all the time. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And out of those, that first album that you put together that you sold, 400 copies of or whatever any songs off of there that carried through them to not a uh, one oh okay. not a one and i don't offer this in the spirit that it at all reflects upon other songwriters or that it should be taken at all as some template mm. i think our arcs are unique and also our own relationship with our material depends upon the person but I don't feel like I wrote a song. I'm 50 years old today. And if I look back and try to drop the plum on the earliest song, which still has a meaningful presence for me, it's, it was a long time before one stuck. I would say probably 1995. <clears throat> so I'd been writing songs for, that was like my sixth formally released album, wow. which meant it was about my 10th album. I think I had to write about 10 albums before I got to a song that I still appreciate today. And you know what that my next hundreds. question is going to be? Which song would that be? Well, there's a few off of that record. The record is called Nomen S. Newman. It was written in 1995, but it came out in 96. Uh, I still really love this song on there, Atavistic Viking which is <laughs> strange, still makes me laugh. And it was a song written in first person as the name betrays is about this genetic reactivation of this tourist's Viking heritage mm -hmm. while he's, uh, I grew up in Minnesota. So I was imagining what if my genetic profile as a Danish person was reactivated in modern day Minnesota and I just went on a marauding bender, uh, <laughs> like a Viking in modern day Minnesota. Awesome. That's what that song is. I still laugh when I hear it. It's really I was funny. listening to that album yesterday, funny enough. No! Um, yeah. So, and would you believe when I, because uh, when I first discovered your music, I kind of, it was, um, I think it was around 2007, 2008 for me, but it was from, um, I discovered a lot of your songs through finding your, your, gig at the fine line that was on mm. youtube at the time so there's a lot of the stuff on there so i had that still on there some of it is not the whole thing i don't think unfortunately i used to love watching that um but i hadn't actually heard that album until really recently the one that you're on about and i kind of went back and i was going to bring this up because your your earlier albums before that had a certain sound which 
to my sort of untrained ear, I suppose I would put more in sort of the, the folk kind mm-hmm. of genre. Although mm-hmm. I do struggle to kind of put your music in any particular genre because it, you know, it, it's so unique. Um, but then this album came out and, you know, sonically it was quite different. It was louder, yeah. I suppose. It was a bit heavier for, for lack of a, a better word. Was there any reason why you made that shift or was it just, just, I want to try something slightly different? Well, here again, there's this funny pattern that I think probably holds for many songwriters, which is it it didn't occur to me until a way into things to ask myself questions like, do I even like the guitar? Do I like the acoustic guitar? Like you learn on what is in your environment, then you find yourself replicating and perpetuating idiomatic moves Mm. something that started to bother me very early on as a guitarist was idiomatic writing uh which is more to do with my own personality Mm. i'm kind of a contrarian and so when i realized god i'm just regurgitating these formulas that i've inherited never questioned and the first disidentification moves you make like this holds true for human development in general i think anywhere you look you identify with something and then as you develop you want to disidentify with whatever it was you identified with Mm. feeling this is going to be something new fresh vital and original Mm. and it's it's very typical that what we end up doing is yeah, you disidentify with folk music, but in this case, as we're talking about music, I, I got out of the singer-songwriter thing as a more primary modality into a more rock and roll or alternative or whatever. But then I grabbed those idioms and the restlessness, which has figured in a lot of my work in any medium, has to do with trying to out idiom whatever it is I'm working in. It's true with screenwriting or paint, whatever. I just have always, I've constructed a language that in part was informed by some of these sensibilities and talk about an impractical endeavor. (laughs) But for me it was practical because the function was can I disinherit the filters which have been operating on autopilot? So when I went to that album, Nomen S. Newman, and began working in a totally different way, I thought I was changing things up. I was really just switching to a different prefabricated set of of guides and rails. So I like that album, though, and probably one of the reasons the song Atavistic Viking remains a favorite for me from them, from that record, is that that song in particular, even on that record, is a very weird, hard to categorize. Yeah, it's a rock song, but it's also got these medieval themes running through it. And then I thought that was really original. And then I realized I was kind of ripping off XTC's senses working overtime. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, another band's been doing this for a long fucking time. Like, I really am just reinventing their wheel. So, yeah, that's been a running theme. As a as a listener, unless you heard that XTC one, which I wouldn't have, you wouldn't have picked up on that. So you can kind of Well, I've ruined it for us all now. I've pointed it out and <laughs> no getting away from it. Steal from the best. <laughs> uh, Andy Partridge and I share the same birthday, which is okay. an interesting thing because XTC was my favorite band, still pr- probably is. Okay. But uh, I have the, January eleventh, same birthday as Andy Partridge. Very cool something in the stars and really you don't hear him saying that about me but whatever (laughs) one day one day when he sees this maybe you never know so might have taught him a thing or two um on that subject then yeah your your musical influences i didn't sort of touch on that with my first question but with the 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 artists that really inspired you um as well as any particular events or anything that shaped your initial thought process when you started writing songs um with that with a particular artist that you not wanted to emulate but influenced your style or, or your, your creative thinking yeah a big one in this respect is storytelling from first person perspective so 
again, looking back, one of the threads that I can track with some consistency is that I've typically been attracted to personification, characterization, or story that is difficult, that is sometimes unappealing, and is related through a first-person perspective. So Randy Newman, great example of someone who's written a lot of charged material from the voice of characters who are unseemly and unattractive, anti-heroes. Mm -hmm. That always fascinates me, difficult situations. So, you know, another instance, there's a song called Dresden off a record, a self-titled record that I did. And it's sung from the first person perspective of this person living in Dresden is giving tours to American and Western tourists. And he's possessed by the aggregate history and shadow of that part of Germany. And that's the kind of character that I love and feel drawn to. And so whether it was Randy Newman or, well, he's the only one that's ever, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some of the others are escaping me at the moment, but that inner aspect of songwriting coupled with any time that I could come across something that I thought was inventive mechanically. So when I found Michael Hedges and the school of guitarists that do the two hand tapping thing, which there's a great proliferation of since Michael Hedges, mm -hmm. that's not anything at all unique about how I played guitar. I'm saying that in the past tense. I don't do that form of guitar playing anymore, but I did it's for decades. It's, it's, it's yeah, and you, you, again, you get into that and you're like, Jesus Christ, this is totally fucking wild, man. We're playing the guitar. And then you realize like, oh, it's called the piano. And they've been doing it for a few, for a few fucking millennia. Like, it's as old as the wheel. So that's a hilarious, and not to detract from Michael Hedges, who was brilliant, genius, gifted, and, and was a singular, I think he would... I believe he also made this assertion. He was much more of a composer than he was a guitarist. But at any rate, uh, musical influences. <clears throat> Anytime I could find someone climbing inside the head of the character, I loved that. Oh. Okay. That's cool. I, again, um, I think about mine. We'll go, we'll go into the, the actual, the, the lyric side of it, really, because... This is what really spurred me when I discovered your music. And around that time, I think yours was the first one that really made me stop and listen to the lyrics. Um, the, your style of playing in that was different as well. So I think it all felt, in the greatest respect, felt uncomfortable because it's totally unlike anything that I'd heard before. So I, I, I did stop and I, I listened. But a lot of the time I you were singing about subject matters, which were completely different as well. So I had to listen to absorb what it was that you were singing about and the stories made their way in. And all of a sudden I was left with, you were singing about stuff I didn't probably relate to or understand at the time, but I wanted to learn more. Lo and behold, I started to discover mm. people who wrote songs like that, who, who were sort of out of the mainstream, out of the norm in what they were writing about and got my cogs turning as well. Um, you, I can't remember what song it was, but one of your songs, maybe a few of them were the reason that I went out and bought the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Mm. Because I wanted to find out more about what it was you were singing about. Mm -hmm. um, in particular, have you got a, a like a, pra a, a process that you go through when you're sitting down to write a song where you, you pull these ideas from or, do you need to be in a particular place, setting, mood, or is it just coming at you all the time? Um, well, I think that to begin with, the work follows the curiosity, right? Creativity follows curiosity. And I don't have anything against personal songs, uh, but... I have never felt particularly enthused about the personality 
as the locus of art. There's exceptions. Like, trust me, I'm painting with a real broad brush here. If I yeah. were to make a list of movies, I'm going to be like, you know, of course, when I say I love characters and anyone who climbs inside of the character, that is an instantiation of the personality as a locus. But it's also not because it's not a song written as a catharsis for my personality or the personality of the songwriter. So the difference between a Randy Newman song that's climbing inside of the head of a interesting, distorted, shadow-laden character is that in micro, that's a study of our humanity, mm -hmm. which is quite distinct from the Bengals writing a song about romance and falling in love or whatever. And not to knock the Bengals. I mean, fuck, I've I listened to Manic Monday as early as last week, right? So I'm not knocking that. I'm just saying that as a writer and an artist, I'm not drawn to it. And I don't think my own personal romantic life is interesting to me okay. as an artist. And so when following curiosity, whether it's the Book of the Dead or existence, uh, why there is something instead of nothing, but why something is predicated on nothing and how nothing is this ever gestating mode of pure potentiality that nothing is not actually an absence or lack of qualities it's the void from within which all qualities arise those are the kinds of things that really always magnetize me as an artist and so when you bring up the book of the dead that's a primary example i did a whole album called, i did actually a few albums one called bright apocalypse <clears throat> which carried many of these themes and was in the mystical lineages, the mystical traditions of various lineages, looking at life and death and awakening and samsara. There was another album a few years ago called Songbook of the Dead. Death has always been, going all the way back to even before Nomen S. Newman, the album that we were talking about. Mm. <clears throat> that album has songs about family death and uh, songs before that. I would actually perhaps update the first song that I ever valued. There was a song on my first publicly released record called Idiot Express, which was literally like 1989. <laughs> That's like 20, 41 years ago. Uh, no, wait, because my math bad, that'd be 31 years ago. Yeah. I was like, out for a minute. I was like, am I 60 years old? I'm not. I'm 50. I know, I know we've been at this a while already, but I'm feeling it's There's a good. song about death on that record, though, that was released in 1989, and I still value that song. But <clears throat> to the great within and the mystery of the human condition as this inexhaustible array of ever shifting flux of subjects. So I found that every time I looked there, there was an inexhaustible supply of songs or mm -hmm. stories or characters. But if I, part of this is a function of the culture we live in as well. I just, in a practical sense, you look for the gap and we are saturated, immersed, and drowning in ego. And I don't mean that in the merely pejorative sense that mm. ego is bad. I actually don't think ego is bad, but we're drowning in it. And it is at this point saturating almost all of our art and has become pathological because now we actually are beginning to equate story with personality. And my view or my experience is more from the tradition that would say story is the demolition of identity in as much as it is the formation of identity. It always operates on that coupling and that diet and that pairing. You don't form a new identity without the demolition of the old one. Yeah, and so yeah. more of the fascinating thread to me is how, what is it that is continuous through the changing, fluxing, developing death, birth, death, birth, identity, disidentity, formation, negation. Those tensions I've always found fascinating. So I look for particular, specific, really precise openings and invitations to express a particular about that much, much larger yeah. 
so I know it sounds real philosophical and unrooted, but if you get into a particular song, like, uh, I don't know, let's randomly think of an example from, um, think of one of your own songs, Stuart. I can't. <laughs> Uh, what albums came after that? Like, that, oh, it's the song Dresden. Yeah. That I was mentioning earlier from, it goes into the first person character mm -hmm. of that soul that has inherited the collective shadow of the German people. Yeah. That's why I love that song, because it's personal, it's specific, it's located in a few blocks of a real city. I was on those blocks. I was literally walking through those cross intersections when I had an encounter with the person and the entire song came out of this witnessing this man go berserk in the middle of an intersection in Dresden. Right. But the reason I love the song beyond that particularity is that it does imply, it does incriminate the collective of not just German people, but humanity, how we got here, how we stay here, how we can get out of this collective shadow. And so that song is uh, the example I want to use because it's real particular and personal. You don't have to give a shit about all those big things. You could still like the song and not even really think about any of this stuff. But for me as a writer, the reason it's interesting is it's uh, scrutinizing the human condition in that weird dark way that's cool it's like <clears throat> multi-layered isn't it you're telling this deeper narrative this is how i perceive it anyway you're telling telling that deeper narrative that you just on about through a particular story at the top so whether you want to look through the, the the subject as it is you know these stories that come up in dresden or whatever and you want to find this deeper meaning below you will find it but if not you'll just enjoy the song for the the story it's telling on the surface yeah uh, so. Yeah, you know, I look at, think of movies we love, right? You make your list of favorite films you love. Mm -hmm. Why do you want to, why are you interested in watching the same film 10 or 20 times? And typically, for me at least, it's because of those registers. It's because of the strata of depth, which yields something for me 15 or 20 years into it that I hadn't excavated yeah. before. And it also involves me as a participant. So my own depth is part of what needs to be brought into the equation and that helps me grow. Cool. I want to delve into a few of your songs in particular from sort of this is this is where I get personal in terms of you know my love of your work. Um so apologies to anyone out there if this gets a little bit particular. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's my show. Hey. Um, <laughs> So yeah, a few songs that are on my sort of my 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 top list of, of ones that I always go back to from your back catalogue for whatever reason. I'm really interested just to hear a little bit if you could remember about the reason you wrote it, the story behind it. Mm -hmm. um, Doppelganger body donor. It's got to be. Oh, I wish I had thought of that as an example <laughs> of what we've been talking about. So, doppelganger body donor. <laughs> <laughs> that song is so fucked up. Um, one thing, <laughs> so I love it. it, it just came out of nowhere. I listened again, it was on that fine line show. I would I tell like, you, in, in all like, honesty, without hyperbole, that song really changed my life, my career, I should say. Okay. Changed my career because as soon as I began to play that song live, things really changed okay that is a song people responded to in a way that i almost would say they never had to anything i'd ever written before that particularly though live performances mm -hmm. that song in a totally unanticipated uncalculated way i mean i was really just, like you do with anything you write stuff because it's moving you in the moment and mm -hmm. you're following that curiosity so you don't necessarily have a good calibration of what an audience is going to respond to. <clears throat> but I remember vividly the first time that I performed that song live, which is actually at the Fine Line Music Cafe. Okay, cool. And the room went fucking berserk. Berserk. And 
it's all anyone talked about afterward. And I didn't have a clue. I really thought this was a perverse little indulgence I was allowing myself in the show. I was like, to my mind, this is a song I'm going to squeeze in between the other songs people are going to want to hear. Yeah. It's for me. It turned out to be very much the opposite way. And so what I was, what inspired that song in particular is I had been touring in Holland and Germany, obviously, Dresden. And so this was, I believe, just after my first tour. It was like maybe four or five European countries, Belgium. But when I was in Holland and I was walking through quite literally the red light districts mm. of some of the towns there to get to my gig, one of my gigs was in a former convent All right. in the red light district. So they had converted a former convent for wayward women. This is Amsterdam, so it goes back like 500 years. Wow. On the reg there, you will find buildings that are like 500 years old and they're still using them. And <clears throat> I had a concert in this former convent for wayward women that had been converted into a music venue and walking through the streets, I was going through all of these red light. And if you've never been to a red light district before and you've never been on tour in Europe before, like everything was so fucking new and potent and distilled in this acute sensitivity that your cross-cultural nerve endings are coming alive in these initial moments. And so when I arrived and was immersed in that atmosphere, I just, I began to formulate the excuses or case that I would use to get out of jail for the things that I wanted to do that while I was there, right? Like I was imagining committing all of these crimes and then what uh, my defense would be right. in a court of Dutch law. And at the same time I was reading about walk-ins and spiritual practitioners or those interested in, in the anomalous or the paranormal will recognize walk-ins as these instances when a disembodied or discarnate soul takes over the body of a living, you know, yeah. a healthy enough vessel of a human being. It's kind of like the previous personality or soul is pushed aside or pushed out and a new one steps in, walks in and gets the body, but it's still that old soul. And so my defense for all of the transgressions was going to be that there was a walk-in, <laughs> someone the first lines of the song around last night, someone drove these balls around. <laughs> and uh, that that's where that song theme, came from. Gentlemen. I mean, if you haven't heard the song, that really yeah. does set the theme. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it is, it's, it's one that's always stuck with me. Um, and I think a lot of the performances that I saw from that show, uh, when I first sort of started delving into your, into your work, it's, it's your emotion and your passion as you're playing it, which is effective um and you kind of you know regardless of what the lyrics are telling you you enjoy it you know at certain points i thought i should be horrified by this but oh, yeah. this is amazing <clears throat> you know and i think with a lot of your stuff i um i love watching your live performances i downloaded i think you had up on one of your websites you had some like bootleg or some live demo tracks i absolutely loved the versions of these songs that are just you and the guitar um i i love listening to obviously the studio versions but I, I will always go back to that because it's just i don't know just the rawness of it is is brilliant and it really sort of um i woke something in me when i was listening to it but that song in particular i will always love that version because especially you, you look like you're going crazy you look like you are possessed by what well that's that character right yeah. i mean i think that this is the this is the part of songwriting and performance that actually just is acting. And when I say acting, I wanna define and reframe that word as well, because I think sometimes in some quarters there can be a hint of acting as mere personification or mere pretending or mere enactment. And as 
lovers of film and TV and theater know, real acting is just full on absolute embodiment of the truth of that character. You let the character fully, completely be. And so in that song and performing that song, I feel the way about songs that I'm sure a lot of actors do about their characters, which is you don't analyze and judge the character in the midst of their, whatever it is they're into, that they need to be in personhood with what their personhood is and what, what their being is. And so that's what I felt about songs, which is like, you really, the character has to sing that song. That's that character's song. And that goes for all kinds of, there's mystical songs, there's deep contemplative songs of all kinds of whatever's in the human emotional canon. But when you don't feel that anymore, that's when I knew, you know, at times when I've, when the relationship ends with a song and you don't feel that way about it anymore, then I just don't perform them anymore. I really actually don't perform at all anymore, not for that reason. Okay. But, you know, like when you learn this as well in screenwriting and story writing in general, which is you don't write characters that you don't love. You don't play characters that you don't love, especially, especially a villain, right? Villains don't perceive themselves to be villains. No. They're simply beings and they're going after what the being is going after they're not after good or evil or whatever so that song was very fun to play for those reasons and it was just the character yeah i find villains were some of the, the best characters to write about as well in my experience because i've got one or two one in particular that i'm probably most known for for people that have read my books and um, he really is just an extension of me. Again, a bit like that song, really. In a situation, what would I do? What would I like to do and be able to get away with? And that's what this guy is. You know, he's doing stuff that he can get away with because of who he is and sort of, you know, what he is. So. But uh, um, Absolutely. Pick another one, that Before Beyond. Beautiful song. That song is really about my wife as the true embodiment of Dakini. So within most of my, the emphasis or greatest territory in my spiritual life has been Buddhist practice. For me, mostly Zen, but I've also been really spiritually promiscuous. I've been all over the map. And if it's a mystical tradition, I'm into practicing it. My wife is a long-term Vajrayana Buddhist practitioner. And <clears throat> within Vajrayana Buddhism, you have bodhisattvas and takinis and when I when we entered into our romantic relationship and decided to have a family I really had this this somatic deep pre-verbal recognition and experience of her particularly in giving birth when I was with my wife and she was giving birth I shit you not, something else. Talk about walk-ins. Like, I, whatever I was in the room with mm -hmm. when my wife was giving birth, it was so old and powerful. And she made sounds. She made music in giving birth. She was in labor for like 24 hours. And my daughter was two and a half months premature. Wow. We were sleep deprived. And the whole room became this altered state for us both uh but her particularly obviously is the center and axle of the axle on which this entire thing was turning mm -hmm. and she i saw her in that experience and got to be with her in that experience as her full complete true dakini self and i realized again pre-verbally i was not cognizing any of this in my head i was just swimming and almost drowning in it really that it was not a metaphor dakinis are not metaphors deities are not metaphors that the real living presence of her tradition and her came into the room and when it did shit through down it was fucking insuperably ineffable but i nonetheless tried to f it with that song before beyond and that that song before beyond is really about being in the presence of her as this 
living a mortal deity or living a mortal deity self, not just that. It's also kind of about this decoy technology that the mysteries use. They show you a beautiful woman, you fall in love with it, and like you're you're going in for the kiss and it's pulled out at the last minute, and then you find yourself falling face first into Dakini presence. And uh, that's what that song is about. Wow. Very, very cool. This is what I loved about your stuff as well, because you you lyrically i think i could see anyway there was a bit of a shift uh, at a certain point where your songs became a lot more spiritual and i think they were the ones that i at first didn't totally understand because i wasn't on that plane and that's they're the ones that i really wanted to find more out about um does that come just very quickly does that come from a stage in your life where you we're discovering that for yourself or, or has that side always been there and you just decided to draw on it musically later on? Well, I would say now that how I experience the mystical traditions and practices is as a function of interiority and when I got into being an artist, I thought the series was, I became an artist, I began making art. Then I found mysticism in my early 20s, Zen Buddhism, esoteric practices. And then I thought, oh, this, you know, this is the deep shit. We're really the age old traditions of the great within. But now where it's actually come full circle is I now understand all religion and all mystical practices from any time in human history to be derivative. They are derived of the creative lineage. The creative lineage is the primordial lineage. It's the original. There is nothing in front of it. There is nothing that precedes it. So the actual primordial lineage of creativity is what gave us signifiers, mm -hmm. is what gave us phonemes, is what gave us architecture, is what gave us fucking crops, is what gave us every single item we value in the human canon of achievement and development, including all the religions. All the religions are derived of the creative lineage. So the creative lineage being, how do we get something from nothing? Mm -hmm. which by the way no one to this day knows or understands no one there's because it's never duplicated the cosmos has never have, had a duplicated moment and no artist has ever had a duplicated moment there are no duplicated moments there's only ceaseless infinite novelty and originality emerging moment to moment and you can either participate in that passively or actively artists participate in it actively and they become if not experts at least vetted, trusted, liminal sentries who conduct the ritual of something from nothing by straddling form and emptiness, manifest, unmanifest. And so how I would, to answer your question, was it always there? Well, I think interiority was always there. I think that the magnetic pull of our own inner ageless ground of being was always a source of curiosity to me and certainly like i think again to go back to the first song that a person ever writes or the first painting a person ever does where we have that experience of holy shit how does this like what just happened this didn't exist and now it existed and i couldn't really tell you how but i know i was important integer in the equation that i think is the real old tradition and religion or mysticism is a much more recent arrival on the scene because the primordial lineage of something from nothing, that goes back millions of years. I mean, we're literally talking about cave paintings, flint tools, and a host of receding into the depths of our truly old genetic memory of history we cannot cognize, relate, or pull above water, but nonetheless informs our day-to-day 
decisions, choices, and participation as artists. Does that answer your question? I think I so. Was yeah, I'm not going to argue. Kind of a tangential. At all. <laughs> I think, <laughs> I think you, you've answered that beautifully. So, yeah, I'm just going to leave that one there. Um, a couple more songs just to rattle off. Um, the next one, maybe a little bit more of a sort of, I would say, an obvious one, maybe, in terms of the story of the song. Um, windmills and wheat fields. Oh, I just yeah. I just love everything about it. I love the melody. I love the lyrics. And again, it's one of those that is is slightly darker to the compared to the stuff I was listening to at the time. So I guess that. yeah, this is so that that's a really interesting example for me in that that entire song was originated in the image. So that first arrived as an image, and the image became a song, and the image was. Okay. Uh, a man strapped up on a wheel and the wheel is spinning while he's getting a blow job. So it was really like this functional sexual curiosity around, first I loved the image and just thought that, what if the Vitruvian man were spun on an axle and then got a blow job? And <clears throat> that's what I do on a Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking and right, right visually, right? <laughs> so as soon as I saw that image, I just the rest of it flowered very naturally from that. And I think at the time that I was writing that I was had recently been or was on tour in South Dakota and was driving through the Badlands and just seeing some of the landscape of South Dakota and then the rest just Okay. Arrived within minutes. That know. that wasn't the explanation I was expecting at all. So that's brilliant as well. You were hoping I was saying it was just a historically accurate. I, I thought of it was some life. sort of biographical piece, not necessarily of yours, but someone <laughs> maybe you know. But I'm that's... sure it is by now. <laughs> right, someone's done. It. Um, the final one I'll touch on then in this sort of um, this sort of section, ladder. It's again is one that I think is, is such, yeah. a, such a beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful one, this indeed. Yeah, ladder. That's funny because I really I remember the day I wrote that song so very very well. Uh, I was in my parents' garage. They were out of town. I wasn't living there, but I was. I think I was house sitting, and I had was hot, and I was like barely wearing any clothes because it was so hot. But I was in the garage, and. <laughs> There's something about the acoustics that I liked in the garage. And so I wanted to play out there, even though it was really uncomfortable. Like I could have gone inside in the air conditioning, but I, I liked the sound that was out there. And I had just finished reading Sex, Ecology, Spirituality by Ken Welber, and who became a very close friend. Uh, actually, he was the best man at my wedding, and I was at his wedding, and I married his ex-wife, and he's the godfather to my children. Okay. So it's really, there's a lot of uh, cool. twist in that knot. Uh, the song, Ladder, is having gotten into his work and more broadly the mystery of human evolution, particularly the mystery of inner evolution so not just a series of hominids set up and let's let's look at the darwinian composition of five million years ago hominids to now more the inner arc of how we have changed why we have changed why we haven't changed when we haven't and how our own disowned shadow so the big thing with that song is that yes we're evolving but fuck is it ever wobbly and dangerous mm -hmm. and boy is it ever there are a host of invisible forces grabbing at the wheel and that song is about those tensions of uh, i think the central image of the song is that is the ape and the angel mm -hmm. and how they're both disowned aspects of the human being so you very often you find human beings that are like able to disown and project their own devils and demons. You know, it's easier for us to yeah. look at other people and think like, what the fuck was up with Hitler? Um, 
And that is part of our disowning of our own collective shadow. But we do the same thing with angels. You know, we do this romanticized uh, disowning of our own higher selves where we think, let's, boy, I hope we can get rescued. Boy, I hope there's a Messiah. Boy, I would like to meet an enlightened being yeah. so that they could enlighten me. And they can't. No one can integrate your shadow for you and no one can allow you to inhabit and claim your own disowned higher self. That's the bad news of evolution is yeah, <laughs> we actually don't have to do it, but it sucks. <laughs> and that song is about claiming your ape and your angel, claiming your devil and your angel both. Yeah. That's cool. And I, I think to me, it's a song that you can probably bring out at any point, you know, of our present, our future, whatever, and it would be relevant. You know, that message of yeah. you know, how fragile is this? It is so, perennial. I think it would have, uh, yeah, I agree. Before before I start to step away from focusing on your music to before we finish, you know, just kind of discuss a couple of the other things that you've got going on. I do need to ask, again, it was the song that I first discovered you on. And the reason that I discovered your music was um, your rendition of your song Smoke with Ed Kowalczyk mm -hmm. live. Mm -hmm. um, I just need to know, really. Ed, a, Ed Kowalczyk of live live i would know them from <laughs> i gotcha you did you did i'm gonna cut that bit out <laughs> don't man leave it in and i'll send it to ed yeah no yeah do it um i was kind of i was gonna even send this whole thing to him i would absolutely love oh yeah it. yeah of course so, totally um but yeah I, I i need to i need to sort of you know ask you how did that come about so sort of when did you first meet him how did your collaboration sort of happen i know it wasn't yeah happening. that's funny Sorry. because again there again it's ken wilbur um okay. ed and i were both are both friends with ken and ken wilbur for people who don't know is a philosopher has written dozens of books translated into i don't even know at this point it's like 30 some languages i believe if not now for a long time he was the most translated living philosopher so anyway ken is a lot of people read, read his books and a lot of artists are moved. I'm certainly not unique. I mean, he inspires artists from every medium, generation, and continent. And Ed and Ken were friends, and me and Ken were friends, and Ken basically was saying, you two need to do something, you know? And this was like throwing copper time. Yeah, yeah. Ed was pretty busy, had a few things on his plate. <laughs> Exactly. Still is, I'm sure. Yeah. And it took a long time. And the way that it happened was that Ken literally got us together in his house. There was some kind of event going on in Ken's house. Ken's house used to be a bit like a salon, right. like in the old century, century and a half ago since how salons were so popular as cultural philosophical artistic gathering places and ken's house had that kind of function where he would okay. get leading people from every domain and realm and just gather them together for a party over a weekend and that kind of thing was going on and ed and i were both there and then ken just sat us <laughs> literally just sat us down and he was like you're gonna do something together today yeah. what are you gonna do like you're the two of you are gonna perform and ed and i had never met I think Ed probably was like, what the fuck <laughs> have I been, what is this? Like, uh, but then this funny thing happened where I played a Laravo jum Larave jumbo guitar. Larave guitars are not particularly, maybe this point they are, maybe they're more famous now, but at this point there were not very many people playing Laravays and there were, there was no one playing Larave jumbos. Right. And I only played Larave jumbos. And Ed played Larave jumbos. Okay. So at first, he can introduce us, take us into this room. He's like, the two of you are going to do something together today. And I think both Ed and I were both, you know, I mean, I'm a fucking introvert. I'm like, and I'm a Lutheran, and I'm from Minnesota. And it's like, you don't do this. You right. don't fucking do this. You never, like, culturally where I come from, you never do this shit you don't overstep it's just like super bad form i would never reach out to someone to try to get them to 
do a fucking performance with me on short notice. It's just gross. But Ken didn't give two shits. He's like, you two are doing something together. You're doing it today. And I think Ed and I both were like, uh, no, I don't think we are. And then, but Ed was like, is that a Larrave jumbo? And I was like, yeah, it is. He was like, Jesus Christ, that's the same guitar I have. And I was like, that's crazy. And that broke the ice. That's how I remember it. Maybe he, he'll do an interview with you and he'll remember other parts of it. But so why he was just like, what do you got? You know, and I... I don't even know why. I just started playing the song Smoke. And he was like, oh, I really like this song. Let's let's do that. He pretty much, like, we rehearsed for, I'm not even kidding. I think it was, like, less than five minutes. Wow. I think he heard the song once yeah. all the way through. And then was like, what's that part again? And what's that part again? That's where that came from. And then wow. we became friends. And then later on, he we did other stuff together. He, uh... Yeah, he also came song. in and sang all over that song Miracle that's on uh, the album Jesus Christ Some, uh, Something Simple he's on that record as well Right. but that's how that performance happened that's cool, that's cool and that was, I was when I first found that again YouTube was great back in the day because um, I didn't have Spotify didn't have any kind of streaming service or anything, I had it on YouTube um, because I was searching for um, Ed stuff. I was absolutely fanatical about live. I was trying to learn more of his stuff. That one came along, completely sent me on to you. And then I would, I, I spent um, that day, I walked into town. I was on my own. My wife was away. I walked into town. I had it playing through my headphones on my phone on YouTube. It probably cost me a fortune in data because <laughs> I had no streaming. But I had to, I, I was just listening to that. And then I, I think off the back of that, your rendition of Psycho Killer. Mm. those two songs i just did on loop basically for a few hours because oh man i got a great talking head story if you okay. go uh, cool. i have a i have a few more minutes here i don't have a hard out until noon my time that's fine. so that's like another that. probably another 20 minutes if you that's want cool. yeah yeah um <clears throat> i have a great talking head story though uh i was playing in san francisco and I was a big Talking Heads fan at that time. I was doing, I would like, for fun, to close shows, I would do Psycho Killer, and sometimes I would do And She Was. Mm -hmm. And I'm playing in San Francisco. I still can't fucking believe this happened, but this is just how the fuck it went down. Right. I'm playing And She Was at this club in San Francisco that holds 200 people tops. And I'm in the whatever part of the song and Jerry Harrison walks in the fucking door of the club <laughs> and stands in front of the stage while I'm playing and she was and everyone in the room is complete like they know it's Jerry. Yeah, this is yeah. their local, right? And Jerry's with this guy whose name is Colin Smith. <laughs> and... They're so close to the stage that, like, I can hear what's going on between them. I don't even think the club was sold out. And I can hear this, this guy. I didn't know it was Colin at the time. But I can hear him, this young person, turning to Jerry Harrison being like, isn't this fucking amazing? It sounds great. Doesn't it sound great? Wow, this is so great. And Jerry Harrison's like, I don't, you know, I don't verbatim, but he's just like, I fucking, you know, I don't think it's that great. Who cares? Wow. It's like, so what? It's not that great. I think he's, he wasn't feeling super enthused about the talking heads vibe in general, <laughs> maybe at that point. Okay. But the, the I do the finish the set and Colin comes over and he's like, Jerry Harrison's fucking here. <laughs> Come over and meet Jerry Harrison. Right. So I go over there and Jerry Harrison's like, I love. Him, don't worry, but he was just like totally a dick. <laughs> oh, <really? laughs> he was, like uh. he didn't have a single nice thing to say or whatever. And Collins literally standing there between us, going, "It was great, you know, it was great." So what was going on was that Jerry Harrison was producing Collins' record, and right. the studio was up the street like a block. And they literally just came in to get a drink in between tracking for a few moments. They walk in. I'm singing that song. Colin loves it. And it's totally in Jerry's face the whole time they're there. Jerry's not into it one bit. And 
at that point, I just think like, that's a great story. That's I I'm actually doing. love that story better than I would have if Jerry Harrison would have been into it. <laughs> this is even better. So that's not even the story. Right. Okay. The story is I am at the same club a year later, same fucking club. And I swear to God, I'm playing uh, Psycho Killer. Right. And Jerry Harrison walks up to the fucking door of the club and literally like walks in and sees me and is like, Jesus Christ, does this guy <laughs> ever play anything but talking fucking head songs? Uh, like he's only been in the club twice. A club crazy. owner came over and told me this. She's like, he's only come here twice ever. He lives a block away. And the two times he's walked <laughs> in the door, you have been on stage singing a talking dance song. <laughs> Was that the last time you went in then? Did he just That's the last that? time I ever played there. <laughs> uh, I said, I can't do this to him again. <laughs> Three times it's going to kill him. That's probably weird. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing that. That's, yeah. that's quality. Um, so I did want to touch on sort of other things, if we can, just very, very quickly, other things that you've gone on and done, because there's one thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sex, God and Rock and Roll, um, your series, I absolutely loved it. Again, um, it's something that I've, I've discovered for myself probably only recently in the last sort of, you know, four or five months or so. Um, one particular episode I need to ask you about, probably it's the obvious one. You got to sit down and interview Kermit the Frog. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> man. That was intense. I have to say that you kind of don't anticipate, uh, like to frame it up a little bit, that interview took place at Henson Studios, which used to be A&M Studios, which used to be Charlie Chaplin's okay. production lot. That, that lot is, has a history that goes back more than 100 years. It's one of the most historic studios in the world. So already just without exaggeration, almost every person you can name or think of has recorded there. Right. Every record, like you can't even believe the records that have been made in that space. So it's already just seeping and soaked with mm -hmm. history and like all of Charlie Chaplin's original cutting equipment is there and his soundstage and his office and it's, you can still interact with it. And so mm -hmm. the whole place is historic to begin with. And then the fact that Kermit came on the show no one ever thought that was going to happen. Um, I knew Steve Whitmire, who voices Kermit, or did until recently. He, okay. he voiced Kermit for 30 years. Jim Henson personally selected him to carry on as Kermit. And Steve, yeah, Steve was Kermit for more than 30 years, I believe. Yeah. Steve was voicing Kermit at the time. Disney had already bought Kermit. And we just thought there's no way in hell that... Disney is going to let Kermit the Frog come on a TV show called Sex, God, Rock and Roll. And the show is fucked up. I mean, it's got all kinds of, it's not for no. young people. So, no. you know, like it's, it's a kind of blue show. So we just thought it'll never happen. But Steve Whitmire was like, I'm going to try. I, I'm not the one who gets to decide yes or no what Kermit the Frog does, but I'll try. I'll put in a word. And what happened was we started talking to them like four months before that episode and they just kept not saying no. Right. You know, they always were like, uh, we doubt very much this is going to happen. We just doubt very much this is going to happen. Well, what was really amazing and cool was that they never said yes. Basically, yeah. Disney was like, here's the deal. We're just, we're going to look the other way for a day. They were just kind of like, we're gonna we're gonna not say no right and we're gonna like See i don't happens. remember exactly how they put it but it shocked me so hardcore because first they said yeah we're just gonna not say no and on the phone i remember being like that's a yes right that's a fucking yes <laughs> exactly. this was days like a couple days before the interview and then <clears throat> i said well what's off limits you know is there anything we can't what do you want us to not? And she was like, nothing, nothing's up. You can, whatever, it's your show. You do whatever. <laughs> you know, we just couldn't believe it. Yeah, so 
that's how Kermit the Frog happened. And they were so cool about it. I have to give whoever was in charge of Kermit at that time at Disney was that was one of the coolest exchanges ever. And then, of course, like, here's the thing, though, like when Kermit the Frog shows up in a room, it was fucking wild. It yeah. really had this like there was famous people in the room. Yeah. It's not important who they were. The, the important point was that the effect was the same on everyone. Like there was these hardened, salty, seasoned, you know, Hollywood directors and yeah. whatnot. And it was like a sprinkling of fairy dust shot into all directions in the room when Kermit came out. And everyone was just like, this is, it was fucking magic. It really was. Yeah, it was, when, it's I, a when, I, when I saw that and when I watched it, I I still had in my head, is this is this real? You know, is it the real one? Or did you just get an elaborate <laughs> puppet and someone who did a really good impression of it? And sort of that you himself. would go to jail for. That, that yeah, I did think how, how would you have got away with it? But I mean that's yeah. that's even better. So there's a wild thing about that is that you know, at this point again, still Steve Whitmire. Hmm. I think this, I don't know the details of why Steve Whitmar is no longer Kermit the Frog after 30 some years, but I believe it may have had something to do with the fact that at this point in Kermit's history, when we did that interview, like they didn't do that. They never did that. There's no, there's not like a team of Kermit's going out and doing five publicity things at the same time, that is not a thing. No. It's always only ever the real Kermit. And there's only one person who voices Kermit. That was Steve. Yeah. And I honestly feel like if I had to guess that Disney didn't like that, they wanted five or six Kermits and right. they wanted it to be more like a franchise. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, that may have been a factor. I don't know that to be true for a fact, but that's my gut. That's good theory. Good theory. Um, to, to, to get into the end part now, I normally give my guests um, just a chance to kind of plug anything that you're, you're doing at the moment. Um, I know that you, I believe uh, you, you've got your own podcast still on the go, Aliens and Artists. Is that right? Correct. Yeah, I have a uh, podcast, Aliens and Artists, and the name pretty accurately summarizes the content. It's about how contact with non-human entities impacts human creativity. And we just do, I think we're coming up, uh, we're in our 80s at this point. We do these deep dives with artists who have had contact with non-human entities. Many or most of them are abductees or contactees, but not all. It includes pretty broad tent for varieties of non-human entities. That podcast has been going, yeah, fuck, I don't know, 80 weeks, like 80 weeks, but however many weeks, a year and a half or something, yeah. um, which is going great. And then beyond that, I do, I do a lot of work with, uh, I have another organization that I'm a co-founder of called The Experiencer Group, which is a membership site for people who have had anomalous experiences and that includes everything from out of body to near death experiences to mediumship to anything under the huge inclusive anomalous with a capital A. Yeah. And that membership site's probably it's coming up on a year old. Uh, it's thriving. It's closed. It's a private site. Mm -hmm. So this is like no trolls, no assholes, no. anonymity. The rails are up. The walls are up. So if you get in, you know, it's private. And then beyond that, I still do, you know, my day job is like screenwriting and um, I'm working on movies now still. And I see artists one-on-one. -on -one. I do work with creative people and spiritual practitioners one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that kind of fluctuates throughout the year. But, you know, mostly like I'm, I'm like the dad to this dog <laughs> and I'm a husband and a father and I do like the family things and I drive the ballerinas of and that kind of thing. Of course. Yeah. I, you, it's, it's, it's amazing really how you do all of that and still, you know, you are still a dad, husband, father. I struggle. I must have been last year and a half to kind of balance the creative side and my, my human side. Um, but yeah. hopefully one will win out. 
but um listen thank you Stuart. this has been an absolute honor talking to you um, it's been a great joy thank you so I, much for thinking of me no no problem at all i think i can probably fill another episode if not a series talking to you um yeah, going down a few rabbit holes um so you know at any point in the future we can make this happen again i'll be sure i'm happy to come back yeah you just let me know when you get a cancellation and you need <laughs> someone to plug in on short notice ah no problem no problem i don't get cancellations no. <laughs> we'll see no thank you so much Stuart. absolute pleasure talking to you sir happy to do it man i'll speak to you again okay peace my friend If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to like, share and hit the subscribe button. Also follow us on Facebook and Instagram to keep updated about all future shows.